Hey guys, it's Ellen Brock, novel editor. I hope you're all doing really, really well. Today is part two of the flat arc video. If you didn't see the first of the flat arc videos, I recommend that you watch that one first. This one won't really make a whole lot of sense without that one. Uh, but because this is just a continuation of the previous video, I'm gonna jump right in with no further introduction. So we are at this point at the third quarter. So now that that fish out of water experience and the acclimating to the new world of the second quarter is over, the midpoint, which we went over in the last video, acts as a sort of refresh for the story, resulting in a pivot in the third quarter, with the character now moving towards different goals and often implementing different techniques or taking different sorts of actions than we were, we were seeing in the second quarter. So for example, in Legally Blonde, uh, Elle's now working on a court case and she wants to fairly defend their client. So that's a new goal and new types of actions being taken. Matilda starts trying to stop the trunch bowl and improve the lives of Miss Honey and of the other students in the school. Um, granted, this is a fairly subtle shift. It's easy to miss if you're not really looking for it, but we do see that sort of classic transition from being more reactive in the second quarter to being more proactive in the third quarter. Because often the flat art characters are paired with other points of view or other co-protagonists, things like that, we often see their shift paired also with a shift in what other characters are attempting to do. For example, in Gattaca, Vincent shifts from simply hiding his identity to, to achieve his dream to try to go into space to trying desperately not to be caught or implicated in the murder that's happened, which wasn't his fault, but he's concerned about being caught for that. Uh, meanwhile, the side characters and the antagonists have now switched to actively pursuing and trying to identify him. So we also see a switch in what the other characters are up to as well. Paddington shifts towards getting all the inmates to work together to improve the prison. Uh, meanwhile, his own family back home, they're, uh, they have their own storyline and they're working towards trying to clear Paddington's name to try to free him from prison. So we often see that two different things going on. Uh, I mean, two different shifts for two different characters or, or a set of characters as well as the protagonist. We, we often see more than one shift in what's going on with the characters. I will uh, also note that in Whale Rider, the bigger pivot is for Paikia's grandfather, Koro. He is the growth arc character and he gives up uh, on his school for the firstborn males and falls into a sort of depression. If relevant to your particular story, it is okay to put the focus that pivot and that focus more heavily on the growth art character, if that makes sense. So that's an option as well. So we want to see some refreshing of the story in the second half by introducing new goals, new objectives, new, new tactics, new actions. Usually the flat arc character will pivot, but like with Whale Rider, sometimes that element is sort of glossed over to center the positive arc protagonist itself. Um, often the co-protagonists, the side characters, the antagonists, or just a group of characters who represent society as a whole um, will also shift in their goal as we move from the first half to the second half of the story. So let's get into the actual plot beats now that we've just gone over the gist of the third quarter. So first up, we have the reaction to the midpoint. In positive arc stories, the this moment is almost always an emotional low, but in the flat arc, it's almost always an emotional high because in the vast majority of cases, the flat arc protagonist has just experienced a, a big win. They've just enacted their own values or expressed their own power for the first time. So they have a lot to be positive about or to feel good about at the this reaction to the midpoint. Uh, for example, uh, Elle shouts happily after getting the internship in Legally Blonde. Matilda laughs with her friends about the trench bowl, getting embarrassed. Um, Paddington is happy that the inmates are happily eating marmalade sandwiches. But there are exceptions to this. So like everything with structure and with the arc, we always want to talk about alternative scenarios that might come up. So an exception to this would be in Gattaca and in Whale Rider. In both of these stories, the characters are sort of oppressed to a degree that their situation is, is too oppressive for them to have a high here so they they still have an emotional low as we would typically see with the positive arc for example vincent and gattaca sort of panics in the locker room after learning that they found his eyelash at the crime scene in whale rider Pikea seems sad that she upset her grandfather coro so we do tend to see these lows 
in certain situations where the character is quite oppressed and they don't really have the ability yet to, to take a meaningful action at the midpoint. Either option works fine. Uh, I would say to note that this moment will usually be an emotional high except in cases where the character can't change their world or they just don't have enough ability to, to make an impact or to enact change on their world. Um, we talked about this in the last video with Gattaca because he's hiding his identity and can't actively change his world. The way the plot points manifest in Gattaca is it, a bit different than what we see with the other flat arc characters because the story just dictates that it be slightly different. So we never want to put ourselves in a really, really tight box with what we're able to do because sometimes it actually just won't make sense with the story that we are trying to tell. Um, interestingly as well, I want to mention that Pykia can't change her grandfather's mind at this point. And to make this even more logical, she's actually sent away. So she's actually sent to go stay with relatives and that gets her out of the picture. So we don't have that question in our minds, well, well why isn't she trying to change things for her grandfather? Why isn't she working on the relationship? She's actually written out of his scenario. So she's still in the film, but she they're no longer together. So they're no longer able to interact. And that actually is a way to sort of fudge a little bit to get those plot points in and uh, to sort of have the story go the direction that we want without disrupting the structure. So you can gauge what works best for your story and like all the pop points, there are always opportunities to fudge things a little bit like Pykea being sent away to just improve the logical flow so that things make sense and work. Next, we have emotions come to light. As with any other story, this section almost always features a heart to heart between the uh, protagonist and another character. It will involve clarifying feelings that have been present all along, but maybe only now are able to be said out loud or able to be truly acknowledged. Uh, it will help, this moment will help to convey the themes of the uh, story. And usually with flat arc protagonists, the emotions that come to light are the emotions of a side character rather than their own. So typically with the positive arc, we would see this moment having to do with the protagonist expressing their own emotions or expressing something that they haven't been able to express previously. But with the flat arc, we tend to see this moment coming from side characters who they're the ones often who are growing. And so now often they're the ones who are able to express something that they haven't been able to express previously. But in most cases, uh, this, plight of the side character or this emotion revealed by the side character will hit on or mirror some of the deeper level issues going on with the protagonist. So it'll almost reflect the plight of the protagonist in some sense. For example, in Gattaca, Vincent's love interest, Irene, who does not know that he's assumed a different identity, so she doesn't know that he's genetically inferior, she talks to him about how she's actually genetically inferior and she has a higher likelihood of heart failure, so she's not as genetically qualified as the people around her. And this is a, a sense of insecurity, or it creates a sense of insecurity in her. And she also worries that he won't be interested in her romantically because of this. So she opens up about, about that concept, even though she doesn't actually realize, but we know as the viewer that it reflects the themes of the film and it also reflects uh, Vincent's own internal struggle and his own um, situation and his belief that he's been grappling with, which is uh, his ability to overcome his genetics or overcome what's predicted that he'll be able to do because of his genetics. So, and then in Legally Blonde, Vivian, Warner's new girlfriend, comes into Elle's room and they have a heart-to-heart -heart in which they sort of talk about the way men in their lives treat them. And even though Vivian is her romantic rival, they both understand that theme of women and femininity being devalued. So it reflects the same themes, even though it's not coming from the protagonist. In Matilda, we also see this with Miss Honey. She t tells Matilda how she was mistreated as a child. Matilda's being mistreated as a child. And Miss Honey t talks to her about how things will get better. And this obviously ties, t ties themes together. Occasionally, the heart to heart will come straight from the protagonist and have more to do with their personal insecurities. This is more typically what we will see with positive art characters, like I mentioned. But with the flat art character, we can see them talking about anxieties or worries or fears or insecurities that they have. We just need to be careful that these moments won't reflect the need for growth or for change. They're more, they will more so help us to see how society has hurt this character. So it's not about them needing to grow, but we may still see them um, causing or introducing or starting the heart-to-heart -heart conversation. 
For example, in Will Rider, Pykea and her grandmother have a conversation in which Pykea asks her, you know, what will happen if the if their if her grandfather Koro fails to find a male leader, and she sort of expresses her concern and worry about him and what he's trying to accomplish. And so she's the one who expresses a concern, but it doesn't indicate any need for her to grow. It doesn't suggest that she needs to have some kind of character arc. Next, we have the failed attempt to succeed. So as with many of the other plot points, this is a case where we have to sort of flip the plot point on its head. So rather than the protagonist failing to succeed, as we would see in a traditional positive arc story, it's actually society's attempts at keeping the protagonist down that fail. So instead of the protagonist failing to succeed, society's failing to succeed at oppressing the protagonist at this point. So from the protagonist's perspective, this will actually present in the opposite way as what we would see with the positive arc. So the protagonist will actually experience a major success against the world or against society. Um, so we could call this society fails to succeed, but I think I'm going to keep the focus on the protagonist and just call this something like a taste of success. So this success will involve using a power that the protagonist has had all along. And for the first time, that power is going to create a big reward. So we may have seen them dabbling a little bit at the midpoint with, with sort of moving towards being more proactive, but here we're going to see more, uh, more strength from them and in a more pronounced success. So something that is more recognized and more substantial, something a little meatier than what we saw at the midpoint. For example, uh, in Legally Blonde, after struggling with the case, Elle gets a lead when she realizes the man that their female client is accused of having an affair with is gay based on the fact that he knows that her shoes were from last season. So since fashion is her special area of interest, it's sort of something that she's been um, made fun of for and treated as less than for and people treat, treated her like being into fashion makes her dumb. Uh, we now see her finding a success with that thing. So she almost is finding her power in the thing that previously people used to oppress her. In Matilda, she gets um, quite the sequence of successes at this point in the story. So she learns how to use her and harness her uh, telekinetic powers. She helps her parents avoid getting caught by the uh, cops for stolen car parts. She stands up to her bullying brother. This is a great sequence of successes for her, but the one that really matters for this plot point is when she directly gets one up on the antagonist, Miss Trunchbull. She succeeds in scaring the Trunchbull by using her powers to make her house seem haunted. She also successfully retrieves Miss Honey's childhood doll. In Paddington, the other inmates and his new friends say they want to help him clear his name so he can go home. He and his friends successfully escape prison together. Meanwhile, we also get a classic failed attempt to succeed for the family back home who go to the cops with the identity of the bad guy and aren't taken seriously. So if you do have growth arc characters or you have another group of characters who are more so following the growth arc structure, they may experience a failed attempt to succeed even as you are um, flat our character may experience a success here. In Whale Rider, Pykea dives and finds the whale tooth that her grandfather Koro threw into the ocean in the second quarter, and none of the firstborn boys were able to retrieve this tooth, but she's able to retrieve it. Um, so she's using her power of leadership and devotion to tradition to succeed here, and there's also a bit of implication that she may have been in some way uh, born destined to be the leader of her people. Interestingly, Pai uh, Pykea finding the tooth is not revealed to Koro yet. So this is a nice way to give Pai the success on time at the right plot point, but without it impacting her grandfather's perception of her, without it starting his character arc, so he doesn't have to face the fact that she succeeded in this thing that means that she should be the leader because he doesn't know about it. So again, I think it's a really good example of how we can kind of fudge those plot points a little bit. We can sort of fudge how things play out so that we can have the story that we want so that we can tell the story in in a compelling way without feeling too restricted by what the plot points indicate should happen. So we go from the taste of success to things get even worse. In the case of the flat arc, we can drop the even worse because the even worse is more so for the positive arc character who would have experienced a failure and then an even worse thing happens now. So in this case, um, things will just get worse. So instead of being kicked while they're down, which is what we see with the positive arc, 
Instead, they're gonna be knocked down from a pedestal. So they're on a high and then something bad is gonna happen that knocks them down from that high. Not only are they knocked down, the deeper meaning of the moment is to reinforce to the protagonist that the world has not taken on the lesson. Um, the, that belief that they've embodied throughout the story, the world's not taking it on and the negative belief or the false belief of the world is still prevailing. So for example, in Legally Blonde, despite doing a great job uncovering a key element of the case, uh, her professor Callahan hits on her and she realizes he never took her seriously. He just thought that she was attractive. In Whale Rider, Grandpa doesn't show up for Pai's speech that she dedicated to her love and respect of her grandfather, Koro. She realizes that he still doesn't see her as valuable, although, again, uh, uh, there's some nice fudging here of the plot points and making this work the way that it does. Her grandfather actually was trying to come see her speech, but she doesn't know that. So we get the same effect that we want while also letting the grandfather demonstrate that he's growing and he was going to go see um, her speech after all, but, but she does not know that. So it's, it's a things get worse moment for her. And it's a very uh, sad, it's a tearjerker moment. It's so sad if you watch it. Um, in Paddington, the inmates, his friends who helped him break out of prison, they tell him that they tricked him and actually they're not going to help cl clear his name. They're actually going to uh, escape to a different country. And that would have, of course involve Paddington uh, leaving his family, which he doesn't want to do. So this is a pretty big blow for him. In Matilda, this is something that happens without Matilda knowing. So the Trunchbull finds her hair ribbon at her house. So after Matilda made her house seem haunted, the Trunchbull finds her hair ribbon. And um, that will spark the Trunchbull into teaching her class or asking to teach Matilda's class because she sort of wants to confront Matilda. So this realization that their world is still not going to take on their belief or accept them for who they are leads to the lowest point. Um, this is the moment when all seems lost both internally and externally. Most importantly, this is the moment the character crumples under the antagonistic force and more specifically, the belief of society that they've been fighting against all along uh, finally really gets to them. So doubt really takes over here in most cases, not in every single case, but often doubt will really take over here. For the first time, they might really think the negative belief of the world. They might really think maybe, you know, maybe the world is right. Maybe this is true. And they might start to think maybe they're actually not good enough. So this will be a really dark moment for them. To the reader or the viewer, it looks like the, the protagonist might actually not overcome the discrimination of the world, so we might feel that maybe they're actually not going to succeed after all. For example, in Legally Blonde, Elle quits law school and runs off. She says she didn't earn her internship, that Callahan only found her attractive, that no one takes her seriously, that she's just a joke, and it's a really sad, difficult moment for her. In Whale Rider, Pai cries about her grandfather, Koro, not being at the speech, and she struggles to continue through it, hurt that... He didn't care enough about her to show up. Of course, he was trying to. She doesn't know that. Um, in Paddington, after escaping prison, he calls his family from the payphone and they don't answer. And he thinks they really have forgotten about him, just like all the other inmates told him what happened and he never believed that it would. But in this moment now, doubt starts to take over. Now, in some cases, we won't really see the character experiencing doubt. For example, uh, Matilda, having recently perfected her telekinetic powers, she doesn't really experience fear about the Trunchbull teaching her class. Instead, the fear and doubt is given more so to Miss Honey. Um, there is generally more wiggle room with movies because we can more easily switch focus to a different character. So in a book, it's a little bit more awkward to suddenly jump into a different point of view if we've never been using that point of view. But movies can a little more seamlessly turn the focus on to a different character that hasn't really been the focus previously. So while this might be a feasible option in a book to shift the focus to a different character and have a different character experience doubt, it's probably going to be difficult to do that unless you've already established the point of view of that character. So it's not just a new point of view coming out of the blue to take over this plot point. Um, so in most cases, the character will experience doubt at this point. And generally, if there is doubt, the second plot point is going to be a lot more prominent and obvious because uh, this is very similar to what we're used to seeing in the positive arc with the second plot point being a sort of big moment or big uh, realization of what needs to be done. So 
in the positive arc, this is a moment, the second plot point is a moment when the protagonist realizes what they need to do and who they need to become in order to succeed. In the flat arc, the character more so decides to overcome the setback of the lowest point by engaging once again in their belief in themselves and their ability to succeed. That's because um, who they need to be is who they've been all along. So they just need to to re-engage with that, reconnect with who they've been the whole time. They don't need to learn to be someone else or to grow in any way. Uh, th this overcoming of doubt is caused by some sort of inspirational spark. So something inspires them to not feel doubtful anymore. Just like with the positive arc, often this spark comes from a pep talk from a side character. So a side character encourages them and inspires them to re-engage with that belief and to be themselves again. In Legally Blonde, Elle, Wood, Elle Woods cries in the salon and one of her other professors is there and says that if she lets Callahan ruin her life, then she isn't the girl that she thought she was. Elle then deci decides to kick her doubt to the curb and help defend their client again. In Paddington, his family returns his call on the payphone and they tell him that of course they didn't forget about him um, because they're his family and Paddington kicks away his doubt and they decide to join together to stop the bad guy Buchanan. But the pep talk is optional. I know it's pretty common. It doesn't have to be what causes this spark. That inspirational spark can really come from anywhere. The important thing is that it causes them to kick doubt to the curb and to enter the climactic sequence. In other words, the events at the second plot point need to spark the character to move towards the antagonist to stop them once and for all, usually with a level of confidence that exceeds what they've possessed at any point in the story previously. That said, because the second plot point doesn't have that aspect of the character realizing who they need to become, sometimes the second plot point in flat arc stories is a, a little soft feeling compared to what we might be used to with the positive arc stories. In Gattaca, Vincent is cleared of the murder and so his dream of going up into space is safe, but he says that he needs to meet the detective who closed the case, who he has realized is actually his brother. This still functions as the final realization and decision about what, what must be done to succeed. And it does have emotional significance given he and his brothers were, were, he and his brother were rivals in their childhood. But we definitely have to squint a little to see it. It's not as obvious as it might be in most positive arc stories. Though in a novel, we get more introspection and perhaps it would make more sense, even in, even if you were going to write this story as a novel, perhaps it would make more sense to um, make that leaving behind the doubt aspect more prominent through introspection. So again, in a, in a film, we do get a little bit more wiggle room because we have so many um, other things we can focus on and, and so many effects we can create with the way it's filmed and the music and uh, focusing on facial expressions and all these things. We have a lot more options in terms of slight shifts to manipulate the perception of the plot points or manipulate the reader's emotions to to mirror what we would want them to experience for the plot points. If there are co-protagonists in the story, we might more commonly see the growth arc character carrying the second plot point, given that the growth character does have to have a realization about who they need to become and not just what they need to do. So if you only need one point of view character for the second plot point, so not two second plot points, not one for the flat arc and one for the, for the positive, but you have co-protagonists, you really only need one, it will almost always make more sense to give this plot point to the growth arc character because it is such a significant moment in, in their journey where they realize who they really need to become. You don't have to do that. It could be a surprise. So the um, positive arc character, we could not see their second plot point and they could show up later on to sort of save the day and we could find out retroactively that they had this sort of realization. But uh, in many cases, it may make more sense to show the uh, positive arc character having this realization. In Whale Rider, the main cast of characters sees that Koro is standing among the beached whales. Koro asks who is to blame, indicating that he has perhaps realized that he might be to blame for not finding the leader. Though, since we don't get any introspection, his exact realization isn't entirely clear. And again, in a novel, this would probably be made more obviously clear what exactly he's thinking. But since in films, we're used to not really knowing what people are thinking. It's only implied. It, it works okay in film, but yeah, in a novel, we would probably be more specific about exactly what he's thinking here. And that gets us to the climactic sequence, the fourth quarter. So the fourth quarter is almost always the shortest of the quarters. It's usually only about 20% 
Often it's even less than that. I would say in many flat arc stories, it's closer to like 15%. It can be quite short, but you can take that full 25% if it's necessary. So just do what makes sense. Don't get too hung up on exactly the length. I would not go over 25% for the fourth quarter, but under even under 20%, I wouldn't really worry about it. Um, I think it tends to veer shorter for the flat arc uh, protagonist because usually the climax of the flat arc is more about the protagonist finally outsmarting or outdoing or overcoming the hold that society has had on them. And often this is more of a gesture or an action or a single event than the type of protagonist antagonist showdowns we're used to seeing in more positive arc stories. Uh, but there can be a lot of variety. It's just that in positive arc stories, we often see more um, elaborate uh, protagonists tracking down the antagonists, making plans of how they're going to defeat them. There's usually a lot more involved because those stories tend to be um, less so just about enacting a specific belief or a specific power. And in the positive arc stories, the arc often is more so in the background. It may be extremely in the background or it may be technically it could be even more prominent than the main plot line. We just, we tend to see the, the flat arc that the arc is more what the story is. It's more the main part of the story and the plot more so facilitates expressing the flat arc. Again, I'm being very general and broad here because it's going to depend a lot on, on different aspects of the story, what you're trying to do, what you're trying to accomplish. But, but anyway, so the fourth quarter is where the flat arc protagonist is going to make the final push towards overcoming how society has treated them and to achieve their, their dream or their goal. We will also in many cases see growth from the side characters during the fourth quarter. If the character had a full traditional arc, we might have started to see growth from them in the third quarter, but often there isn't that much time to devote to these um, growing, these growth characters. Sometimes they're just side characters. They often won't have their own perspective. They may, but they often won't. Um, so we might only really see that growth is occurring here in the fourth quarter. We can see that growth occurring. Um, we can see it occurring really at any of the plot beats in the fourth quarter. So it's okay if it occurs at different points. I'm going to point out a few as they come up. So first in the fourth quarter comes the preparation and the approach. So this is when the protagonist gets ready to confront the antagonist. Most stories have a preparation phase where the protagonist may compile resources or gather allies or just in general prepare to start approaching the antagonist. Um, they may also need to, to obtain information or, or um, gather intel that's necessary to defeat the antagonist as well. Sometimes this is just a moment, sometimes it's longer. The preparation phase is followed in some cases by the approach phase when the protagonist or the side characters face uh, various obstacles or they may travel a distance to be able to confront the antagonist. Um, these two phases, I'm combining them into one for the sake of simplicity and because um, they're pretty straightforward. I, this isn't really something that you're going to mess up, so I'm just going to combine them into one. So in Matilda, her preparation phase is when she prepares for the confrontation with Trunchbull by asking Miss Honey details about how Miss Honey's father, Magnus, would have referred to the Trunchbull, what names they would have used for each other, and that's so she can uh, make the Trunchbull think that she's haunted during the confrontation. So that's preparing for the confrontation. In Whale Rider, uh, everyone tries to save the beached whales with wet blankets and pouring buckets of water on them. They try to turn a whale around with ropes, but the rope breaks. In this particular case, there is more focus on the positive arc character Koro, which is totally fine. If you end up with co-protagonists, you can put heavier focus on whichever character makes more sense at various points in the story. In Paddington, he has a pretty classic approach where uh, he and his family rush to try to catch the bad guy Buchanan before he escapes. So they end up um, rushing to a train station. There is a confrontation with a lesser antagonist here, Mr. Curry, who tries to stop Paddington, but his friends and his neighbors all stand up for him and support him. So both secondary antagonist confrontations during the approach phase uh, and demonstrations of that camaraderie earned the, so the side character standing up for him. Those are both common things that we might see in the uh, approach phase of, of a flat arc story. So after that, Paddington rushes to the train station and, and catches the train to be able to confront the bad guys. So that's sort of your typical uh, approaching the antagonist approach phase. 
In Legally Blonde, we don't really get a preparation phase, but we do get a clear approach phase. And again, there is a secondary antagonist. So in this case, Elle shows up to represent their client and Professor Callahan, the secondary antagonist, tries to stop her, but it's allowed for a law student to represent a client with supervision. And her friend Emmett steps up and says, okay, I'm going to help, uh, I'll be the supervisor to allow you to do this. So again, we see a secondary antagonist and we see side characters, uh, a side character standing up and, and supporting the character. So th those are common things that we're gonna see here in the approach phase. Uh, like I mentioned, the approach phase is a very common place to demonstrate the side character growth. Sometimes the side characters will even have their own antagonist to face. We don't see that in any of these examples, not really, but but we do see um, in Legally Blonde, Vivian realizes that she was wrong about Elle, that Callahan had hit on her and Elle hadn't flirted with him, which was her original um, interpretation. So we do see that before Elle shows up to take over the court case, we do see Vivian have that realization. So we see the growth from her. But sometimes we will see a full separate antagonist for a side character. So say maybe a side character has their own bully, we may see them confront their own antagonist in this section. And, and that's something that may work for your story as well. And after the preparation and approach, we have the confrontation. This is what we typically think of as the climax of the novel, the showdown between the antagonist and the protagonist. There might sometimes be multiple confrontations, like I said, and some of those confrontations might all feel like they're part of the climax. Sometimes they might sort of feel like they're in the approach phase. It's kind of splitting hairs sometimes to say, are we still in the approach phase? Have we switched to the confrontation phase? You, you understand the gist of what's trying to be accomplished here. We don't really have to split hairs that finely, but we do sometimes see multiple confrontations occurring. Um, in most cases for the flat arc protagonist, the confrontation is going to be when they prove that they can do what they've been saying they could do all along. Um, often they believe in themselves and their belief even more strongly than they did at the start. They will demonstrate their skill and they will succeed because of unique traits or unique beliefs or unique power. So they will succeed based on what's special about them. So that is what will help them succeed in the confrontation. For example, uh, Matilda makes the Trunchbull think that she's haunted by using her telekinetic powers to uh, make the chalk write a message on the chalkboard seemingly from Miss Honey's deceased father that tells the Trunchbull to leave everything to Miss Honey and get out of town. She's using that special telekinetic power she's been claiming to have all along. Here she's proving she really does have that power. We also see this demonstrating Matilda's internal sense of fairness and justice, which, which is something we see as a prominent personality trait for her throughout the, the story. She wants people to be treated fairly, and here in this confrontation, we see her leveling the playing field. I will also note here that Miss Honey has a moment of growth during the confrontation when she yanks her arm away from the trench pole and says that she's not seven years old anymore, and Miss Honey has really learned how to stand up for herself in relation to the trench pole who uh, mistreated her as a child. As is often the case when there are two antagonists in a story, Matilda also has a second confrontation with her parents. They come to pick her up from Miss Honey's house saying that they're moving to Guam because they were caught for stealing car parts, and um, Matilda asks Miss Honey to adopt her and is able to persuade her parents to agree, so that's sort of a second confrontation. In Gattaca, Vincent and his brother Anton, who turns out was part of the investigation against him, like I mentioned, he realized the investigator was his brother. They redo their swimming race from their childhood and Vincent once again beats him. Then we have him, so that's sort of one confrontation. Then we have him heading into space to achieve his final goal, but there's a surprise DNA test right before boarding, but he manages to pass and goes into space. So there we see the two, two different confrontations. In Whale Rider, uh, Pykea climbs onto the whale despite her grandfather Koro having told her not to get involved. The lead whale, the main whale, the big whale, I'm not really sure what the term is, uh, goes back into the water with Pykea on its back. It goes underwater and everyone on land is scared that she will die, but she successfully gets the whales back into the water and saves the whales. Um, she proves here that despite being female, she is capable of being a leader, which is something that has been clear to the viewer all along, but now it's clearer to everybody else. In Paddington, though there's a lot of physical antics in the final showdown, it's a fairly traditional confrontation with the antagonist where Paddington and his family confront the bad guy Buchanan and ultimately succeed. I won't go through all the ins and outs of how it happens. It's a very traditional uh, antic based confrontation on a train. Uh, in Legally Blonde, the court case functions as the primary confrontation. She successfully defends her client and proves her innocence, showing everyone that she is smart and capable while also using her personal talents and areas of expertise to solve the case. So 
at some point during the confrontation, there will be a surprise. So this doesn't occur necessarily, this isn't a, a sequential, it's not confrontation then surprise. The surprise just occurs at some point during the confrontation. This is usually an exciting solution to a problem encountered in the climax. So it can take many forms, but often what make, makes it exciting in the flat arc is that a side character comes to the rescue in defense of the protagonist because their protagonist has made such a positive impact on this side character. Now we might see this also occurring not as a surprise. For example, Vivian moves to being on Elle's side before the court case, and that is absolutely fine as well. This doesn't have to be the aspect of the story that is a surprise. There will be a surprise. It doesn't have to be this. It doesn't have to be a side character showing up, but it very, very often is a side character showing up in the defense of the protagonist when there is a flat arc protagonist. And this is sort of a reward for the protagonist sticking to their guns throughout the whole story and uh, someone one of these side characters has really taken notice of this and um, really cares about what they're doing so in paddington knuckles the prison chef who tricked paddington into escaping prison under false pretense pretenses feels guilty and returns saving paddington after he's locked up underwater and about to drown this demonstrates that uh, Knuckles has let go of his motto, uh, I don't do nothing for nobody, and instead has adopted Paddington's motto of sort of be kind and things like that. Uh, but it doesn't necessarily have to be that the character had a full arc. It just has to be a demonstration of loyalty from a side character earned by the protagonist. Um, and that's earned by the protagonist sticking to their gun, sticking to their belief. So in Gattaca, the DNA analyst who has been taking his fake DNA throughout the film uh, we find out that when he has the surprise DNA test, right when he's about to go into space and he doesn't have any way to pass it, we learn that this um, and the DNA analyst knew all along that he was faking his DNA and uh, he has a son who is genetically inferior and admires what Vincent is doing. He fudges the results to allow Vincent to go into space, so he is the surprise solution, but it feels earned based on Vincent sticking to his morals and his guns the whole through the whole film. In Matilda, when Matilda's parents come to take her, Miss Honey says she loves her and agrees to adopt her. She loves her for exactly who she is. It's something Matilda earned. It's also a bit of a surprise. Um, this surprising bit of help from a side character doesn't always happen, so it won't always make sense. Sometimes the surprise solution does um, come from how the protagonist solves the problem on their own. This is something we typically associate more with the positive arc character, but we do tend to sometimes see it as well in flat arc characters. For example, in Legally Blonde during the court case, Elle uses the information about the daughter of the, the, the alibi of the daughter of her client is that she was taking a shower, but she uses the information she knows about how the daughter had gotten a perm and you can't get a perm wet to say that the daughter's alibi is fake, therefore the daughter is guilty. So she's using special information. It's also a surprise. It's a surprising solution, but Elle did come up with it on her own. In the case of Legally Blonde, I think having her be her own source of this surprise solution makes sense because we want to reinforce that she can be a lawyer and that she can succeed. We might even still be wondering as, as viewers, can she really do this? Can she really succeed? So I think in her case, I think it would undermine the story to have a secondary character come in and solve the case for her and, and then fix everything. The whole point is that she can do it on her own and I think that's why they made that choice and I think it was a good choice and it worked really well here. During or after the climax, there will be a sacrifice. So in the positive arc, this sacrifice would come from the protagonist and would either be a literal or a symbolic sacrifice demonstrating that they have grown. But in the case of the flat arc, since the protagonist doesn't need to grow, uh, we don't need to see this sacrifice coming from them. So during the confrontation, we see the character standing up for what's right and gaining their success as a result. The success comes from sticking to their guns, not from letting go. So we don't need this letting go moment. So no sacrifice from the protagonist, but um, we often will st still see a sacrifice from someone. Um, it, it won't be indicative of uh, a character growth if it does come from the protagonist. So it could come from the protagonist. If that's the case, it won't indicate the need for growth. But because society is who needs to grow, typically we're going to see this coming from a side character. For example, um, in Matilda, Matilda's parents let go of her and allow her to be adopted by Miss Honey, accepting that she doesn't fit into their family. This is a bit of a sacrifice. 
Um, interestingly though, it does not demonstrate a growth arc. We don't really feel like these are people who have grown. We assume they're gonna go right back to their old ways immediately. So it doesn't have to be that they had a true arc, but uh, we do still see that plot beat being hit of a sacrifice. In Whale Rider, uh, grandpa, her grandfather Koro puts the whale tooth around Pikea's neck in the hospital, demonstrating that he has let go of his old perspective. So he sacrificed his perspective of needing a male leader and he has accepted his granddaughter as the leader. So the sacrifice is him letting go of that false belief or that negative belief. In Paddington, Paddington himself has a near sacrifice moment when he gets trapped underwater and he shakes his head no for uh, Mrs. Brown to stop trying to save him so that she doesn't also die. Um, then we get the true sacrifice of Knuckles showing up, which I mentioned before, he shows up um, to to save Paddington to let, and also makes that sacrifice of letting go of his motto, I don't do nothing for nobody for nothing. And um, him letting go of that perspective is the sacrifice. So again, we might, a lot of these things may be very close together during the climax or sort of the climactic sequence that we may see during the confrontation, the, um, the surprise and the sacrifice in that case almost are the same moment. In Legally Blonde, Warner L's ex-boyfriend says he was wrong about her, about not taking her seriously, and now he wants to get back with her. So that demonstrates him sacrificing his old viewpoint, sort of, that she's not good enough. Again, we might consider that to be a little bit fudged because has he really learned anything or does he just like her now because she's popular? Does he really believe in her now? I don't know. There's not introspection in film, so we could debate what people truly think in film, but it does function as that sacrifice moment. And she ends up uh, rejecting him, which is an important aspect as well for her to, to let go of that. So we may see that as a sacrifice, her letting go of that relationship, but it doesn't in any way indicate letting go of a belief. It's not an arc. She doesn't shift in her belief or perspective at all, but she does ultimately um, let go of Warner, mainly because she's just realized that he's a jerk. So it's not really anything to do with her growing. Then finally, we have the aftermath. This is when we get to see how the character's life has improved since the events of the story. It might be a scene or it might be a brief moment or it might simply be implied. In Gattaca, uh, we see that he is launched into space, achieving his dream of going into space. We don't really get much after that, but we can assume that, you know, he's happy and he's achieved his dream. In Matilda, we see Miss Honey and Matilda together having the loving family that they deserve and that they always wanted. In Whale Rider, everyone from the movie is together at the end, even uh, Pikea's father and um, his pregnant girlfriend are there. Uh, she leads the chant on the boat and her grandfather Koro smiles at her, clearly indicating he's accepted her and her value in the traditions of their people. In Paddington 2, Paddington wakes up at home and everyone tells him all the good things that have happened in their lives because of him and because of his help. They also all pull together to get his aunt to be able to visit him from London, which was something that he wanted. So we see a very good happily ever after. And in Legally Blonde, Elle gives a speech at graduation and text on the screen indicates um, that uh, Emmett, the friend from earlier, is going to propose to her tonight. So she's achieved both her academic and personal dreams. And that brings us to the end of Flat Arc Structure. I really, really hope that you guys found this helpful in clarifying the differences between the Flat Arc and the more traditional Positive Arc Structure. If you have any questions, let me know if you are on Patreon, you can ask those questions for the podcast. If you want to join Patreon so that you can hear the podcast, it's uh, available at the $5 and up tier. If you are not on Patreon, you can leave questions in the comments and I will do my best to get to those as well. So if you want to help support the channel, there is a podcast on Patreon. We also have a Discord at the $2 and up tier. The podcast is at the $5 and up tier. And the cheat sheet for this or the, the tip sheet for the flat arc structure will go up on there. I haven't finished it yet. It shouldn't be too long before it goes up on there. So hopefully I'll get that done in the next few days, get that up there so that you guys can reference that instead of rewatching the video or having to take notes on the video. So that is all for now. I will be back with a new video in a few weeks. Most likely that video will be about editing or it will be an editing demonstration. So if you don't wanna miss that, you can subscribe or you can um, use the little bell icon to get notified. I know some of you don't get notified, so you may want to do that if you're not getting notified of my video. But anyway, in the meantime, happy writing, guys.